Publisher's Preface of A Popular History of Ireland, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of Ireland from the Earliest Period to the Emancipation of the Catholics, Book One, by Thomas Darcy McGee. Publisher's Preface Ireland, lifting herself from the dust, drying her tears, and proudly demanding her legitimate place among the nations of the earth, is a spectacle to cause immense progress in political philosophy. Behold a nation whose fame had spread over all the earth ere the flag of England had come into existence. For five hundred years her life has been apparently extinguished. The fiercest whirlwinds of oppression that ever in the wrath of God was poured upon the children of a disobedience had swept over her. She was an object of scorn and contempt to her subjugator. Only at times were there any signs of life, an occasional meteor flash that told of her olden spirit, of her deathless race. Degraded and apathetic as this nation of helots was, is it not strange that political philosophy, at all times too Sadducean in its principles, should ask with a sneer, could these dry bones live? The fullness of time has come, and with one gallant sunward bound the old land comes forth into the political day to teach these lessons, that right must always conquer might in the end, that by a compensating principle in the nature of things, repression creates slowly, but certainly, a force for its overthrow. Had it been possible to kill the Irish nation, it had long since ceased to exist. But the transmitted qualities of her glorious children— who were giants in intellect, virtue, and arms for fifteen hundred years before Alfred the Saxon sent the youth of his country to Ireland in search of knowledge with which to civilize his people, the legends, songs, and dim traditions of this glorious era, and the irrepressible piety, sparkling wit, and dauntless courage of her people, have at last brought her forth like Lazarus from the tomb. True, the garb of the prison or the cerements of the grave may be hanging upon her, but loose her and let her go is the wise policy of those in whose hands are her present destinies. A nation with such a strange history must have some great work yet to do in the world. Except the Jews, no people has so suffered without dying. The history of Ireland is the most interesting of records, and the least known. The publishers of this edition of Darcy McGee's excellent and impartial work take advantage of the awakening interest in Irish literature to present to the public a book of high-class history, as cheap as largely circulating romance. A sale as large as that of a popular romance is, therefore, necessary to pay the speculation. That sale the publishers expect. Indeed, as truth is often stranger than fiction, so Irish history is more romantic than romance. How Queen Scotia unfurled the sacred banner, how Brian and Malachi contended for empire, how the pirate of the north scourged the Irish coast, the glories of Terra and the piety of Columba, the cowardice of James and the scourge of Sarsfield, how Dathi, the fearless, sounded the Irish war cry in far Alpine passes, and how the Geraldine forayed Linster, the deeds of O'Neill and O'Donnell, the march of Cromwell, the destroyed angel, Ireland's sun sinking in dim eclipse, the dark night of woe in Erin for a hundred years, eighty-three, ninety-eight, forty-eight, sixty-eight, Ireland's sun in rising glory. Surely the youth of Ireland will find in their country's records romance enough. The English and Scotch are well read in the histories of their country. The Irish are, unfortunately, not so. And yet, what is English or Scottish history to compare with Irish? Ireland was a land of saints and scholars when Britons were painted savages. Wise and noble laws, based upon the spirit of Christianity, were administered in Erin, and valuable books were written ere the Britons were as far advanced in civilization as the Blackfeet Indians. In morals and intellect, in Christianity and civilization, in arms, art, and science, Ireland shone like a star among the nations when darkness enshrouded the world, and she nobly sustained civilization and religion by her missionaries and scholars. The libraries and archives of Europe contain the records of their piety and learning. 
Indeed, the echoes have scarcely yet ceased to sound upon our ears of the mighty march of her armed children over the war fields of Europe during that terrible time when England's cruel law, intended to destroy the spirit of a martial race, precipitated an armed torrent of nearly five hundred thousand of the flower of Irish youth into foreign service. Irish steel glittered in the front rank of the most desperate conflicts, and more than once the ranks of England went down before the exiles in just punishment for her terrible penal code, which excluded the Irish soldier from his country's service. It was the author's wish to educate his countrymen in their national records. If by issuing a cheap edition the present publishers carry out to any extent that wish, it will be to them a source of satisfaction. It is impossible to conclude this preface without an expression of regret at the dark and terrible fate which overtook the high-minded, patriotic, and distinguished Irishman Thomas Darcy McGee. He was a man who loved his country well, and when the contemptible squabbles and paltry dissensions of the present have passed away, his name will be a hallowed memory, like that of Emmett or Fitzgerald, to inspire men with high ideals of patriotism and devotion. Cameron and Ferguson Note from 1857 until his death, McGee was active in Canadian politics. A gifted speaker and strong supporter of Confederation, he is regarded as one of Canada's fathers of Confederation. On April 7, 1868, after attending a late-night session in the House of Commons, he was shot and killed as he returned to his rooming house on Spark Street in Ottawa. It is generally believed that McGee was the victim of a Fenian plot. Patrick James Whelan was convicted and hanged for the crime, however, the evidence implicating him was later seen to be suspect. End of Publisher's Preface